Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Do you know the mirror is not quite 200 years old? I had to look this up. Apparently it was invented in Germany in 1835, and before that people used whatever bits of reflective material they could find to behold their own countenance. But for the most part, uh, part that is, most folks didn't seem to know much about their facial appearance or they had to ask other people about it. We think of the mirror as one of the greatest inventions of all time, perhaps only eclipsed in the current generation by the front-facing phone and the selfie stick. A lot of people get away without a mirror nowadays because their phone will give them a mirror image. I was going to ask you to be honest and say, who, who has never looked in the mirror? But n- none of you would be able to put up your hand. I couldn't put up my hand. We all look in the mirror because we want to look our best be- before we show ourselves to the world, even if it is under a mask. The mirror tells us things about ourselves that we can't otherwise know unless someone else looking at us tells us. And in most cases, we would rather find these things out for ourselves. I'll give you an example. This is too much information, I know. As you know, uh, just from mere observation, I have a hard time growing hair on my head these days. But as I get older, I seem to have grown an incredible ability to grow hair out of my ears. Now, happily, because of my blonde childhood, most of these hairs are very, very fair and and only noticeable either by feeling them, and there's one right there, uh, or, or seeing them in the right light, one or the other. But I would rather get rid of them on my own than be having a face-to-face conversation with somebody and then that that person being distracted because the light is catching this long, gangly hair that's sticking out of the side of my ear. That's why I need to look in the mirror. Now, don't get me wrong. A hair protruding from my ear doesn't necessarily make me a person of poorer character, but I like to be as well-kept as I can, and a mirror kind of helps with that. But the mirror needs to be accompanied by light. If I look in the mirror in the dark or by a very faint light, I'm not going to be able to see much more than an outline of my face. The rich man in the story that we just heard has been looking in the mirror by a very faint light. He wanted, this was his first mistake, right? He wanted to be able to earn eternal life. Jesus, because he was God, knew everything about this guy, so he met him where he was. He, he said, okay, all right, you want to be, get eternal life? How have you been doing on the commandments? You know, how, how did you avoid, did you avoid murder? Did you avoid adultery? Did you avoid stealing? Did you avoid lying? Yeah. Did you honor your parents? Yeah. He'd done these things, he said, perfectly. But then Jesus goes deeper. If the man really wanted to be perfect, what he needed to do was take all his possessions and sell them and give the money to the poor and then follow Jesus. Now, the man might have done well with commandments numbers 1 through 9, but he was not doing so well with number 10, coveting. This is the one commandment that's a little different than all the others because this is not about uh, outward action more than it is about inward attitude. What's more, coveting tends to lead to the breaking of the other nine. Turns out the man had not kept the law perfectly, and he seems to have been unwilling to go the extra mile to keep them all because he walked away from Jesus quite despondent. For, as the Bible says, he had many possessions. He thought he knew the law. He thought he had kept the law, but when he was looking at himself in the mirror, he was looking in the dark. Jesus, the light of the world, shed light on his mirror, and the man found out that he came up short. We're going to look today at the value of the law. And pretty often when we think about the law, the first thing that comes to mind is guilt. Let's say this is, this is not a true story. Let me say this. Let's say I'm driving down the 400 at 140 kilometers per hour. I won't say it's never happened but I'm making this story up. 
The radar gun of the OPP officer captures me in his sights. You know right well he's going to light me up and pull me over. And whether or not I was driving that quickly on purpose, whether or not I had a good reason for doing so, as far as the law is concerned, I am guilty. And I would feel the shame that goes along with that. The law is a mirror. And when I don't measure up to the law, it shines as brightly in my face as the officer's flashlight when he pulls me over and says, license, registration, and insurance, please. In our journey through Romans thus far, the Apostle Paul has written pretty disparagingly about the law. Now, we can be sure he did not do this lightly because, you remember, Paul the Apostle had been Saul of Tarsus, the, the great zealous Pharisee of the Jews who knew the law backwards and forwards, took it seriously, and lived it seriously. And then he met Jesus one day on the road between Jerusalem and Damascus, where he was going to persecute more followers of Jesus. Paul knew his own story. So when he wrote about the law and its insufficiency, he knew whereof he wrote. The law is a mirror. It shows us and convicts us of our own unrighteousness. The great reformer John Calvin denoted three uses of the law in Christian theology, and today's scripture focus shows us the first of those. The law convicts us of unrighteousness. The other two, by the way, are that it makes us afraid to do wrong, which we'll see in Romans 13 when we get there. And the other is uh, that it prompts us to do good works that God has planned for us, which you can learn about in Ephesians 2. But for today, we're going to stick with this first use. The law is a mirror. It shows us and convicts us of our sin, our unrighteousness. Earlier in Romans 7, Paul has said that the law arouses sin, that it keeps those under its authority from knowing Jesus, and that it holds us back from experiencing a full life in the Holy Spirit. These are serious claims. So it's no wonder that he anticipates his first reader's response when he says in chapter 7, verse 7, Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? It's a logical conclusion. If the law is responsible for all these things that hinder followers of Jesus, it might be natural to assume that the law is sinful. But perhaps surprisingly, Paul believes otherwise when he says, of course not, which is the term, the phrase we've heard before that basically translates, you've got to be out of your freaking mind. In fact, he says, it was the law that showed me my sin. It was the law that showed Paul his sin that demonstrated for him that he did not measure up to God's perfect standard. All those years as a Pharisee, he had devoted himself to that law, to the perfect keeping of the law, and to the perfect enforcement of the law. Indeed, if he believed that the law was sinful, Paul would have forfeited any claim he had to suggest that the gospel found its roots in the Old Testament. The law is the key aspect of the Old Testament. Jesus built his ministry on fulfilling the law. Paul's grateful for the law because it convicts him of his sin, but it goes further than that. It actually helps him understand his sin. He continues, I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. That's that tenth commandment, right, that was so troublesome for the rich man. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. Now think about that for a minute. If there were no law, sin would not have the power to arouse covetous desires. If you're not sure of that, think about what happens when you're told not to do something. You know, it was the prohibition laws that caused people to break other laws so that they could consume alcohol in the season when it was not allowed. If your parents tell you when you're young, don't stick your finger in a light socket, what happens? Zap! 
Or if you see a park bench with a sign that says, do not touch, what happens? You walk away with green paint on your finger, don't you? Our natural inclination is to do what we're told not to do. Paul will say more about this in the latter part of chapter 7 that we're going to look at next week. So he, but here he's saying that it's not the law that's bad in of itself. It's what sin does with the law that becomes problematic. He goes on in verse 9. At one time, I lived without understanding the law. But when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life and I died. Died? What, what did he die to? Well, he died to a perfect life, to the notion that the law could save him. He saw his life in a well-lit mirror. So I discovered, he says, that the law's commands which were supposed to bring life brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. Why is the law holy? Well, it's reflective of the the holy God who gave the law. But how can that be? Did the law which is good cause my death? Of course not. Sin is used... Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It used God's good commands for its own evil purposes. Now, it's fair to say that even people who are far from God know what sin is. They know that it exists. What they don't realize, though, is how serious sin actually is. The law is holy and it reveals sin and sin uses the law to slay us. You see how sinful sin is when it can use something good to bring about such tragic results? Even in the church, lots of people figure, ah, they're good people. Now, if you've listened to me more than three or four times, you know I've done everything I can to disabuse you of that notion. But let me say it one more time. Being good is not good enough. We can't perform our way to heaven. We can't be good enough to meet the perfect standard of God. Paul knew he couldn't be good enough to meet the perfect standard of God when he met the Lord Jesus. And he knows the believers in first century Rome can't make it either. That's why he's spending so much time explaining this. It's all for a good purpose. So it's not to make us feel guilty, but to remind us of how important is the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And let me say this. When we get to Romans 8, things get better. There's, a, a, you, there's so much conversation about sin in Romans 5 and 6 and 7, and people think, oh, are we ever going to get through this? Are we ever going to get to Romans 8? Two weeks. Not counting probably one week. Well, anyway, sometime in August, we will get to Romans 8. The way the power of sin uses the law means that no amount of good we can do can ever make up for the sin that we commit, though. That's why in a Christian worldview, for example, karma doesn't make any sense. Uh, I, I'm sometimes astounded at the number of folks who think that this fits with Christian faith, but in no way does it do so. Karma is, is about being good now so that in your next life, you will not come back as a lower life form. It's a, it's a form of Hindu uh, philosophy. But in contemporary syncretism, you know, North American uh, smorgasbord religion where we try to put all kinds of things together that make us feel warm and fuzzy, we tend to boil it down to getting back what you give out. So as some people understand it, if you were to steal my bicycle and you got hit by a car while riding my bicycle, that's karma. It actually isn't. But it also isn't the gospel, and followers of Jesus should eschew any kind of thinking of that nature at all costs. In the Christian faith, we get back better than we give out. It's called the mercy of God. We don't get what we deserve. And it's called the grace of God. We get what we don't deserve. If we just try to be good and hope for the best, it won't work because the law is a tyrant. And sin simply magnifies that. 
The only way we can convince ourselves that being good enough is good enough is by avoiding looking in the mirror. Do you ever look at somebody and say, how did that person leave the house without looking in the mirror this morning? We've all done this, right? It's not a good thing, but we've all done it. And of course, it's a matter of style, personal opinion. We shouldn't pronounce judgment on people based on how they dress or how their makeup is or how their hair is, because that's all on the outside, right? We, we might not like how somebody looks, but it's not necessarily going to be reflective of that person's character. It's one thing to not look at myself in the mirror to see if my shirt matches my shorts or to see if I have one of those gangly hair sticking out of my ear. It's another thing to avoid looking at myself in the mirror of the soul to realize that I don't measure up to the law. But here's the rub. I can stand here all day and tell you that the law only magnifies our sin, but that's only going to inform you of your state and leave you in your sin full of shame, head hung low, I failed again, why do I bother? The trick is to do something about it. Following the law can only take you so far. As Paul says, the law is holy and good, but it has a limit. That's why he has told us in chapter 6 and the earlier part of chapter 7 that as followers of Jesus, we have been set free from the power of sin, set free from the power of the law by the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The law keeps those under its authority from knowing Jesus, but we have been set free from that. The law keeps those under its authority from experiencing life in the Holy Spirit, but we have been set free from that. Indeed, we, we need to know Jesus. We need the life of the Holy Spirit because anything I say and do can, can inform. But only the Holy Spirit can illumine. There can be no joy in the law because the law only convicts us of how bad we are at keeping it. It's a mirror that only shows us the bad news. So what is the alternative? Jesus is the alternative. If you've ever worked for a boss who only told you what you did wrong, you got an idea of what it is like to live under the law. And if you've ever been in a truly loving relationship, you know what it's like to be able to do right and do wrong and be loved by the other person anyway. That's what a relationship with Jesus is like. Jesus isn't going to sugarcoat it, of course. I, I know lots of people who expect that a relationship with Jesus is going to be all about the bed of roses and constant affirmation. But it's not the case. When we follow Jesus, we're still going to be convicted of our sin. The difference is that we can face the reality of sin with confidence because Jesus paid the price for our sin by shedding his blood on Calvary's cross. It's like I said earlier. Everybody knows there's such a thing as sin, but it's only when we come to faith that we truly realize how serious sin is, how sinful sin is. Why? Because we now walk in relationship with the one who paid our ransom. So what can you do in response? A couple weeks ago I talked about uh, some spiritual disciplines that you might engage in through uh, in response to the message and the three that we talked about that day were scripture reading and prayer and silence and solitude wonder, how are you doing with those online there, folks? Uh, today, in response to the mirror that is the law, I want you to think about two other spiritual disciplines that take place in the process of personal self-reflection, in the process of being honest, of being real with yourself. I mean, if I don't bother looking in the mirror, I might happily assume that I don't need a beard trim. But Maury Povich told me otherwise. Shout out, by the way, to Steph, my hairstylist, who for very understandable reasons right now is not yet doing beard trims. I'm in your corner. Personal self-reflection is an important part of growing in faith, and I've talked about this before. The ancients called it the practice of the examine. It's an examination of both conscience and consciousness. The, 
The good news is that it's something you can do every day, maybe as your head hits the pillow at night. An examination of conscience has you ask yourself, where have I not sensed God's presence in my life today because of sin? And then you can engage in the discipline of confession. You don't need an intermediary to do that, right? You can confess your sins directly to God. And as we consider our day seriously, we remember the times when we were rebelling against God. We can confess those sins before the Lord with the promise that when we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. So take some time tonight and every night to confess your sins before God. Let him wipe the slate clean so that you can wake up the next morning by grace, ready to start a new day in a fresh way. Engage in the discipline of confession. If you'll do that, by the way, you can type confession in the comment stream. That goes for you all as well. Uh, or you can make some note of that on your online connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect. The second discipline that is involved in self-examination is gratitude in the examination of consciousness. That is, where in my day did I particularly notice God's presence? When you take time before you go to sleep to think about your day, and you notice where God was at work, you can respond in gratitude. If you'll do that, then type thanks in the comment stream or on your connection card. Possibly you haven't actually made a commitment to follow Jesus and you're still feeling enslaved by the law because of sin. Today you've heard that there's a solution whose name is Jesus and you can come to him in faith. You can tell him you're sorry for the sins that you've done. You can thank him for dying on the cross to pay the price for your sins and rising from the grave to bring you eternal life. And you can name him as Savior and Lord the one who from this point forward will rule your life so that sin no longer is your master. Rejoice and receive the grace that God offers in Jesus Christ. If you'll do that today, then type Jesus in the comments and I'll follow up with you and give you some resources that will help you as you engage in this newfound life of faith. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Show me that the law isn't all. Okay, I'm not a poet. But I know a gift when I see one, and that's Jesus. By faith in him, be set free from the law. Break the mirror of oppression and replace it with the mirror of self-reflection. As you seek to grow in grace and in the disciplines that will help you walk in faith with the Lord, who loves you no matter what you look like. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the law that shows us just how much we need you. Thank you that it convicts us of our unrighteousness, and thank you that because of your work on the cruel cross and in the empty tomb, we are set free from bondage to the law. Take the mirror of oppression and break it. Replace it with the mirror of faith that encourages us to reflect on your mercy and grace for what you have not given us that we have deserved and for what you have given us that we did not deserve. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father, so that we will learn and grow in grace, shaping our lives by your mercy and sharing with others what we have learned that forms us in the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose strong and precious name we pray. Amen.